When you were still in the group, or even now, how difficult was it to tell through the way a person talked and their conduct what level of the bridge they were on? Could you pick a Class 5A auditor from a Class 3, a clear from an OT2, or was it something you could only know through bracelets or literally being told? No, you have to have them tell you, or you'd see a clear bracelet or an OT bracelet or something like that, or maybe you happen to hear or they were walking around with their certificate or something, that you, you cannot tell. There were some very, very chill, cool, calm and collected, you know, nowhere on the bridge, some sort of, sort of Scientologists. And there were some extreme asshole OT8s that I met. I mean, you could, you know, they were just all people. And of course, that makes sense given the fact that the clear and OT statuses don't mean anything. There is nothing legit about them at all. So the only change that you see in people as they progress up the bridge is they putting themselves, you know, putting on a show for the rest of the world by demonstrating a persona or attitude that they think reflects what it's supposed to be like to be clear or OT. You are told, especially right after going clear, there's even an issue from Hubbard that you read um, that makes it, it's, I think it's called an open letter to clears, where he makes it clear that you have a responsibility to uphold certain image, you know, public image, certain PR factor to being a clear. And so don't bring disrepute upon the, the state, I think Hubbard says. Uh, well, I've met plenty of clears who did exactly that. I mean, I've met clears who cheated on their spouses, embezzled money, engaged in, you know, sexual conduct that was completely not okay, even with minors. Um, I have seen clears and OTs who uh, lives were a complete and total disastrous mess. I have seen many, many of them go bankrupt, um, sell that have to sell their houses, downgrade their entire lifestyle because of all the money they spent on Scientology, uh, and then lose it through misfortune or bad, bad fortune. And of course, that it means that I've seen all kinds of OTs who have demonstrated very much that they are not at all cause over life, quote unquote, in any way, shape, or form. They are just as uh, subject to the vagaries and vicissitudes of life as the rest of us. So, um, so no, I could never tell by just looking or by their by how they acted. Um, I will say that there were some people in Scientology. Uh, who I met along the line, who overacted their state. And they were always real easy to spot uh, as fakes. Um, and I'm talking here about a couple of OT8s that I knew who were just so giddy all the time. And hee hee hee, it's all so wonderful. And I was just like, man, uh, okay. Like even as a Scientologist, a lower level Scientologist at the time, I, you know, I wasn't, I didn't look at them and think, Oh, well, I don't want to be OT8, but I just thought, is that really who that person really is? Because that's kind of how you think of OT8s, is you're looking at the actual person now. There's no reactive mind. There's no other case. They are free of all of that. So this is what it looks like. And some people, you know, were pretty calm, cool, and collected, and, and were pretty interesting people. <laughs> other people who had gotten to OT8... Uh, yeah, a little out there. So, and now that I know all about what Scientology does to you, I mean, I'm sitting here making a joke about it, but, you know, the, the truth of the matter is these were very damaged people. So I probably shouldn't make light of it the way that I do, but, um, but that was my responses and reactions to them as a Scientologist, so I thought I'd, I'd share that with you. All right.